and we are live. All right. So today we're hearing from Russell Kors with a talk in Archaeology from the College of Worcester, in addition to an MS in Geology from the University of Cincinnati, where he specialized in paleontology and sedimentology of carbonate rocks in the Cincinnati region. Over the past 17 years, he's taught geoscience courses from secondary to community college institutions in the Valley, including at Broadway High School, Blue Ridge Community College, Lord Fairfax Community College, and Massanutten Regional Governor's School in Mount Jackson, Virginia. He's passionate about geology and earth history and has been doing a great job at developing new tools for virtual field experiences using um, that are useful for students and the community, especially to allow access to places not ideal for field trips, uh, also for people with accessibility needs and for virtual or hybrid instructional situations, which has been a wonderful um, thing for the time during COVID. He's also a co-author of a recent textbook for historical geology courses, free and open access for student use at opengeology.org. He also is currently the president of the Virginia Association of Science Teachers. He's a very busy man. Uh, Russ lives in Connickville with his amazing and inspiring wife, Sarah. Oh, boys. He enjoys hiking long local trails, photographing rocks, and playing higher, higher. Uh, again, thanks for all for attending and let's get into it. Um, before we do though, just one last reminder, please turn off your videos and keep yourselves muted and so that we can enjoy Russ's talk. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mariama, for that wonderful introduction. Um, can you see and hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Great. Well, welcome everybody here uh, to this talk. We're gonna um, we're gonna actually cover quite a bit of ground. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the technology I'm using here is a variety of comes from a variety of places. Uh, I have I owe a lot to the Moore Charitable Trust through the Shenandoah County Public School System for making this possible, and I'll talk more about that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but we're using what, are, what are, we're using 360 imagery here, and it's all compiled on a website uh, that I've been using for that called Kula, and uh, it allows me to take you places without actually taking you places. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, and so each one of these images is geolocated, and uh, you can see all the little orange dots. We're going to start up here, uh, just south of Strasburg in the Tumbling Run area. Um, actually, we start up out here on, on Tower. Tower Road, of course, uh, here in Woodstock. We're going to start over here, and then we're going to work our way down through all of these locations. And I was reflecting on it. If we were all on this field trip together, uh, it would probably require about five 15-passenger vans and a lot of apples and a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to do this in a way that's not so logistically challenging <laughs> um, and to have as many people on this uh, little journey as possible. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, what we're really exploring today is largely why these, these bends in the river exist. You can kind of see them in this, in this shot taken from, uh, well, as you, if you look, look around here, taken from the tower. And most of you have probably not seen the roof of the tower uh, above Woodstock, but there it is. Uh, could use a paint job, I suppose. But here we are um, looking down over the Woodstock area and, and part of the seven bends of the Shenandoah. You may also know that on the other side of Massanut Mountain on which we're standing in Page County are, is another stretch of the South Fork of the Shenandoah that also has very similar bends and for the same reasons. And so my goal today is to really provide a, a historical context, a geological historical context, and to talk about why these bends exist here and not in other places. So let's first look at a tale of two sites. This drone footage uh, was starting here above the covered bridge uh, near Mount Jackson, where, uh, where the river essentially is tra traversing across carbonate rock. Uh, we'll look at the carbonate rock and, and road cuts here in a moment. But yeah, here we are at the covered bridge. You can see the water moving along nicely along the North Fork. 
Uh, and you can see that the, the you can see the channel um, quite clearly, the deep part of the channel, the Thalweg. Here in this image, it's going off to the right of the stream. And then of course, some riffles and so forth. But this, this stream here, and I'm gonna fast forward a little bit because I don't wanna spend the entire six and a half minutes on it. When you look at the link later on, uh, you can do that on your own. Um, but you can see the, the riverbed here consists of a lot of boulders um, all the way down to the sand and silt sized particles. Uh, but as we, as we pan upwards, you can also see bedrock outcropping right over here as well. And the bedrock here is a really important story as to why the river does what it does. Uh, and so we're going to fly under the bridge and we'll just move, move ahead a little bit just to get an idea of what we're going to be seeing uh, a little bit further on. Um, but here's, there's a young man fishing on the bedrock actually. And you can see over to the left, the foul leg of the stream or the deepest portion of the stream. But most importantly, you see it's mostly larger, larger cobbles there along the side. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, pan out a bit here and get a look at the landscape. If you look off in the distance here, uh, you can see the river does meander a bit, but not like the seven bends we're about to see in the next portion of this, of this video. And if I, as we move along the, the valley, of course, we see Massanut Mountain on the right, uh, the Alleghenies on the left, and in a moment, we'll move over to Woodstock. But for the time being, just note that the course of the river is not, I wouldn't say it's straight, but it's much straighter. Uh, and it meanders in a much more irregular way than, we, than it does over near Woodstock. Okay, so in mere, mere seconds, we're gonna make our way over to Woodstock. It'll, it'll transition over to that. This is, by the way, is Mim's bottom. So here we are in Woodstock, taken again from the tower, more drone footage. And you can see the much more regular bends of the, of, or meanders of, of the Shenandoah. And so um, well, how, do these, how do these become this way? Why does the river do what it does here and not over at Mount Jackson? And that's really the question that I wanna look at. So the first thing I would look at normally is just get an idea of what the landscape looks like and what the river looks like across that landscape. Um, this imagery is LIDAR imagery, some of the most recent LIDAR imagery that uh, provided to me from uh, Dr. Dan Doctor, from the, who was a USGS friend of mine. Uh, and this, of course, is really cool uh, imagery. You can see little, little pock marks where sinkholes exist. I mean, there's just sinkholes all over the place. And of course, to remind you, we're, we're flowing over carbonate rock, which is just rife with caves. It's karst all over the place, right? It's very exciting stuff. We've all been in caves, or most of us have probably been in caves uh, in the area. But if you look at the river here, you can see it's meandering. I've got it, I've got it outlined in blue. And so the first thing I might look at is, is, is a measure called sinuosity, which is where I'm taking um, the course, the length of the course of the river and uh, with, with respect to the distance from two points where I'm measuring that course. And when I, when I calculate the sinuosity here, I get a value of 1.35, which is pretty moderate. The gradient is fairly low. In other words, the elevation change is not very, is not very great. Um, and we can also calculate some other things, uh, some other characteristics of the river, the entrenchment, such as the entrenchment ratio. And that's looking at the, the width of the channel versus the width of the floodplain. And here it's approximately a value of three. These are dimensionless values. So this, in, in, in Dave Rosgen's uh, classification, this would give this reach of the stream, probably a C, C3, C4 type classification, which for most of us isn't all that important. I'm just pointing that out because when we look at um, the, the Woodstock reach of the river, um, you can see right away, you can see these cliffs in the LIDAR imagery where the river clearly is much more entrenched than it was at the last site. Uh, but again, if we measure sinuosity just along this portion of the seven bends, which is not, which is, you know, in the Woodstock area over here, um, around Seven Bend State Park, which by the way is right, um, if I'm not mistaken, actually it's, uh, what the is, yeah, so it's right over in this neck of the woods here. There's the state park right there. So Seven Bend State Park makes its way around there. And the, the sinuosity here is much higher, 3.63. Uh, that's because you're getting a whole lot more, you got a whole lot more river across this, across at this distance here than you would um, down in the Mount Jackson area. And um, the entrenchment ratio is not too much different. The gradient's about the same, but the change in sinuosity is enough to make it a, a completely different type of stream which you know, for all intents and purposes is a, is a little bit odd. So you know, what's going on here that's different than what's going on in the Mount Jackson area? Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the first question we have to ask ourselves. 
And I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we move along in here. So without any further ado, let's hop in the vans and move on to stop two. Shark Bay, Australia. Wait a second. That's not the Shenandoah Valley. Well, actually about 500 million years ago, I want you to think about the Shenandoah Valley very differently. There was no valley. And I want you to think about um, the location uh, that, you're sta- that you're sitting in, if, assuming you're um, watching this broadcast from within the valley here, as being much like this. These mounds are stromatolites. These stratolites, stratolites like these have been around for about, for well over a billion years. We have lots of them in the fossil record. I'll show you a fossil one here that's from a uh, local, local outcrop here in a moment. Um, stromatolites are basically mounds of algae. And so the t- they're tidal. So when the tide comes in, it brings with it sediment, which is deposited on top of a layer of algae. And then t- the tide goes back out and the algae grows and the tide comes back in and the sediment's deposited and so forth. And a layered effect uh, is, what you, is what results. But think about for the moment, give you the setting a bit more. As you, put, as you think about putting your beach chair down here, um, a, de- a, a year on earth was what was around 400 days at this time because the earth was spinning was spinning more rapidly at the time uh, on its axis. Uh, there was very there was much less oxygen in the atmosphere at the time. So you would be sitting in your beach chair with an oxygen tank uh, next to you. And uh, there was no, not really much in the way of life on land. Everything that was living apart from algae and some other microbes like that was largely living at this time uh, in the early Ordovician uh, in, the, in the sea. So you could walk around and land, you're just, you're just, it's a geological paradise. You're seeing rocks everywhere, but there's not, there's not really much in the way of fossils or, or li- let alone living organisms. So let's look at some of the rocks from that area. This is the Kanakachig formation, which is not, uh, rock formations, um, the, we give these, these formations names based on locations where we first describe them. And the Kanakachig is not from around here. Um, I have to remind myself where the type section is. I think it might be up in Maryland. But um, at the time, so you have to imagine for a moment, and I'll show you a, a, a picture of what this looks like. But here's our, here's our location, all right? We're over here in a relatively shallow marine area um, and extending out beyond us and, uh, and to the south of us actually would be what we call an Epiric Sea, which is just a, a temporary marine basin, very shallow. Uh, the water doesn't get terribly deep. Really great places in geologic, in geologic history, particularly in the Paleozoic era for life to, life to exist. This is the ancient margin of, the, of ancestral North America and the name we give it is Laurentia. Of course, Laurentia doesn't exist anymore. We're talking about a continent that we have most of still, but we call it North America today. To our South is an ocean that we give the name Iapetus. And a little further South of that, um, probably a couple hundred miles further south at this point, uh, is, it, is what we call an island arc. Kind of think of Japan or the New Zealand or something like that, but there's volcanoes off in the distance and they're making their way toward us to the north, moving north because of a subduction zone. So what we have is a tectonic situation where we have what's called a passive margin, tectonically not an active place. There's no uh, there's, there's, no tech, there's no subduction going on and so forth, but to our south, there's action coming our way. It's just not there yet in the, in the form of the Taconian volcanic island arc. And there is subduction going on. The subduction is what produces the volcanism um, and then the ash will come in a little bit later on. So the Cambrian world looked a lot like this. This is your Cambrian paleogeography. This is the paleo equator here and the earth isn't tilted uh, but it was, it was certainly tilted back then, but it's just not tilted now uh, in this image. But so if you get an idea of where Virginia is, we're down over here, the light blue areas are all shallow Epiric Sea. It's all continental shelf. The brown areas are land and of course, deep ocean in between. But you can see where we are. We're south of the Paleo Equator, a good 25 degrees, maybe even 30 degrees. Uh, and then if we were, you know, the Shenandoah Valley here, if we look to the south, our island, of our island arc of volcanoes is down over that way. But it's a very different paleogeography at the time. Um, at the, and again, and again, you were looking at stromatolites. So here's an outcrop. This image is taken by Callan Bentley, uh, one of my mentors when it comes to gigapan photography. And you can see this sort of layered effect here and this sort of mound in these layers. This is actually an ancient stromatolite. 
And these are just layers of sediment that have accumulated in, what, in, in the Konakachig. And this is what we refer to sometimes as ribbon rock. And uh, it's alternating bands of limestone and dolomite as a result of these algal mat deposits. And these you can find if you look closely in the Konakachig uh, in many different places. So stromatolites were, were, were pretty, were about the only kind of thing that was being fossilized at the time. And um, so they were really, uh, you might think of this as the primary life form that was, that's preserved. Uh, another thing we should talk about a little bit is what's going on here. We, again, we're in a shallow marine area. We're gonna make our way down through some other rock formations whose names were, are gonna become familiar to us um, as including the Beekman Town, the New Market and so forth, the Lincolnshire, the Edinburgh, and then the Martinsburg. The important thing to know is that as this volcanic island arc is approaching us from the south, and we're sitting here, uh, the, the continent is going through what's called subsidence or tectonic subsidence. It's bowing downward as that, as that subduction zone approaches. So we have time on the x-axis down here and subsidence or subsidence on the y-axis. And as we move down through these formations, we're actually seeing a deepening trend. The water is getting deeper and deeper and deeper until we, you know, when the Taconian uh, Island Arc gets closer to us, at that point, you know, we're standing in the same, the same location here is much deeper water. We'll get to that in a moment. And then here's the other critical thing. We get to a transition from carbonate rocks, which are produced largely in the water themselves as carbonate sediment. Uh, and then we transition into terrestrial or terrigenous uh, materials that's, that are eroding off of that Island Arc. And that's what we're looking at with the Martinsburg Formation later on. So let's move on to the next location where we can look at some of this more clearly. This is the Beekman Town. This is the next, um, the next layer uh, from the bottom up. And we'll look at the Strat column here in a moment. Uh, but the Beekman Town, at this point, we are still um, south of the equator. So nothing's really changed in terms of where we're, where we're located. It's still pretty tr subtropical, tropical. Uh, but we're a little bit deeper water now and we have fossils. This is a 3D model I made of a fossil my son Ezra found in our, uh, my in-laws uh, field, actually. You can see the spiral, and, uh, or actually not in the field, but up in the woods. This is a spiral of a, a whirl of a gastropod, or lacanospira, a spira is sometimes what we refer to as, uh, but it's a, what we refer to as a stationary epifaunal suspension feeder. And so it's, inter its life habit is interpreted as a, uh, an organism that basically sat there and passively, um, passively fed out of the water column. Um, there's another fossil here that's a cephalopod, and these are swim. These would be this would have been swimming around, and we'll look at an image of this at, uh, in the next slide here. So if you'd imagine, during the Beekman's town, um, uh, it was it was another it was a little bit deeper environment, a little bit a little bit more a little bit different. Here we're down. This is the Conica Cheek down here. We're making our way up. This is Cambrian. And then we're making our way up into the late Cambrian, eventually going to enter the Ordovician period. These are all periods on the geologic time scale. And true to form in geologic time, the older layers are always on the bottom and the younger layers are on top. We're going to make our way all the way up to the Massanutten sandstone here uh, eventually, but we're going to make our way up from the Conica Cheek to that. So just keep this in mind and we'll revisit this again in, in a little bit. Um, and again, now we're down in the Beekman town, which is a little bit deeper. So I'd say we're about over here. Okay. So a, another important thing is if you looked at, remember that strat column we just looked at, all the layers are horizontal. And here, this is clearly not a horizontal layer. I've got to put a little line in here so you can see what's going on here. This is gonna be important to us. So all sedimentary beds are deposited in an originally horizontal basin. And so we have to ask ourselves, why aren't these horizontal? Why are they tilted like this? And even more so, why are they tilted in a direction that if you look at Massanutten Mountain, this is a signal knob over there. If you look at Massanutten Mountain, they're tilted as if they're plunging down beneath Massanutten Mountain. And in fact, that is what they're doing. We'll talk about why that is more in a little bit, but um, until then, let's, let's go back to our, our stratigraphic explorations. If we move up to, the four, to 480 million years ago, here's our cephalopods. And this is what the Shenandoah Valley would, would have looked like back then. And so you've got your cephalopods, there were some trilobites. Not all of this gets preserved. Fossil preservation is enormously selective. You have to not only have, generally have hard parts, skeletal structures, shells, that kind of thing, but you also have to get buried rapidly typically. And so, you know, maybe 2% of things that, are, that ever exist get fossilized. 
certainly jellyfish, for instance, are were, were around then. Uh, we know they were, but their fossils are extremely rare because they're a soft-bodied organism. But I showed you a bit of a cephalopod in that fossil that I looked at a little while ago. And these are crinoids. They're still around. They still have uh, descendants around today. Uh, this is a eurypterid. Those are extinct. Trilobites are extinct. So there's a lot of evolutionary uh, fun stuff going on here. Uh, but this is what you should imagine when you think of uh, the Shenandoah Valley at 480 million years. Okay, so now we're in the new market limestone. Now we're getting, getting a little bit deeper. All right, but we still have, a, we're still well within, probably within the photic zone, or in other words, the sunlight is still penetrating. And uh, we can get an idea of what uh, these, some of the fossils look like in, 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 in uh, cross sections like this, uh, where we see, actually, there's some fossils here. You can see some shell, shell fragments um, there, and there's a curved shell fragment here as well. Uh, that's what they look like in cross section. These are chunks of calcite. So the white is calcite. And the gray here is the limey mud. And that's largely with the New Market limestone, which by the way is named for uh, a type section in the New Market Virginia area. It's a mud, it's, a, it's what we call, sometimes call a micrite, or we might call it in this case, a grainstone, um, but it's, or, or even a packstone in some cases. But this is a, this is a pretty uh, sparsely fossilized, a sparsely calcified area but there's little bits of, of, of shell fossil cross sections all over the place. So there's definitely life in these, in these rocks as well. It's just not as, uh, not as prevalent as it, as it could be, or as, it, as it likely was. Now, um, we've been talking about these formations and it's important to note that these formations don't just grade into each other all the time, or sometimes they maybe do. This is a contact. So at some point, the new market rocks gave way to the Lincolnshire. And you can see it's not a, this is not a very happy contact, not a nice straight line like I showed you in the strat column a little while ago. Um, there's a lot of uh, undulation in it. But this is what we call a contact geologically. And you can see there's, there's a nice um, crisp line, even though it's undulating, you can definitely clearly see where the, where the two formations um, co uh, make contact with each other. And this is what makes a formation mappable, is I can make a geologic map because I can identify these contacts and that's important. Um, because otherwise it's hard to tell the story of these locations. But you can see if you just stand back, the limestone itself is pretty massive looking, breaks off in big, big chunks. Uh, and you really gotta, you've really got to look for the fossils. So the Lincolnshire, the next formation up, is not a very thick formation, but it's a much rubblier formation. And it's, much, it's got a lot more, uh, many more cracks in it. And you can see these veins of calcite that are the result of uh, calcite filling in um, through water being deposited by water after, after, as an after effect of mountain building we'll talk about in a moment. The Lincolnshire, here's a cross section. You can see fossils are just abound, just abound within the Lincolnshire. You've got some, some layered um, algal type chunks of stuff and you've got some, uh, some plesopods or some um, shells that will just say that for the moment. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. And actually you can see a, gr a good deal of detail. I love these giga macro images. This, this is actually a, a polished section of a rock. Um, and then what Callan Bentley's, he's got a, a rig that allows him to put the rock down on a table and, and the camera takes a whole bunch of pictures at really, really close uh, macro scale and then stitches them together. And you can get a great, great uh, um, understanding of what's going on there, even better than you can just looking at it in a hand sample. All right, so the Lincolnshire is not a very big formation. Um, this, by the way, this tumbling run section is classic amongst the, the geological community locally. Uh, this is the oldest new market stuff and they're making our way over here to the Lincolnshire and we're gonna make our way down to the Edinburgh next, the Edinburgh formation, uh, which for folks in Edinburgh should make you proud because it is named um, for a location in Edinburgh, Virginia. And I've actually never been to the type locality, but we're all looking at limestones. These are our rocks that are formed in the water column. Of course, you've got to, you're gonna have uh, weathering of mountain ranges that contributes the ions, like any salty ocean area, that's where the, where the uh, salt in the ocean comes from, is this stuff washed off of land from the erosion of mountains, including the bicarbonate and calcium ions that come together to produce the calcium carbonate that make up limestones. Um, but again, these are produced in the water column, chemically produced in the water column. Now at this point, we're, we're still in, the, in our um, empiric sea, you might be a little bit further over here, whereas we were originally over here in the Kanaka Chig. 
now we're over in this neck of the woods. We're going to make our way down into the, the deeper part, uh, the deeper part of things. We're not going to get down to the eye up in this ocean. That's going to be gone before we get a chance to get there. Um, but let's go ahead and move along here. This is about 460 million years ago, and our mountain range, our, our mountain range is getting closer. And now we're here in the Edinburgh. And the Edinburgh Formation, uh, this is another picture of the Edinburgh Formation. This is at Strasbourg exit. Uh, let's see, it's the one with McDonald's at. I can't remember if that's exit two, uh, 298 or something like that. Um, but you can see the Edinburgh Formation um, is, is full of layers. It's, it's a little bit rubbly as well. It sometimes has some nodule looking stuff in it. Um, but it also has some interesting fossils. Most notably are graptolites. Graptolites were colonial, and uh, you can see they look, kind of look like saw blades. But what's interesting to me about this is we don't get a lot of fossils in the Edinburgh uh, of stuff that's kind of scurrying around on the, on the seafloor. No, instead we're getting fossils of stuff that's planktonic or floating around in the, in the water column like graptolites did. Um, graptolite anatomy is, is interesting. These are, these are actually broken off little bits uh, if we look at what a graptolite actually looks like, these are uh, the lateral view of what we call theci and um, stipes of the graptolite, which all come together to make, to attach to a sicula. Um, and so these, these are all extinct, by the way, there's no graptolites around today. Inside of these stipes, these theci, all right, are little, these are little holes, and that's where the organism itself actually lived. And so if you think about an organism like this, you're probably looking at um, tens of thousands of little uh, zoids sitting in theci all over the place in this organism, just floating around in the, in, in the ocean. But of course, we're putting this together from scant fossil evidence, largely carbon films, and that's all these are preserved as generally. Um, these aren't the best examples. There's other examples where graptolites have kind of been defined by their, uh, their, their morphology. All right, so we're going to leave the Edinburgh. We're going to move down into the deeper waters here in a moment. Um, if you think again, just keep thinking about those volcanoes out from the distance. The Edinburgh Formation uh, has uh, certain layers in it that are really special called bentonites. You may have heard of bentonite as a material that's sometimes used as, as, a, as a, uh, a grout material around water wells, for instance. Uh, but bentonite is a, it's a clay that expands. Uh, and typically, uh, the bentonites we're talking about are rich in volcanic ash, and so potassium bentonites. And they're basically ash deposits from these mountains. And so they were, of course, erupting. And some of them are quite thick, um, tens of centimeters thick in the Edinburgh. And they weather really, really easily. They're really hard to find in the field. But the Edinburgh formation does contain ash layers throughout it. And that's important because we can date those ash layers radio, radiometrically. And that gives us an idea of how old things are. So that's part of how we're uh, constraining our ages here. So we move on along a little bit further. Um, we're about to transition into the Martinsburg. And by the way, this is a lovely spot. Uh, this part of Tumbling Run on Battlefield Road before you hit Route 11, it's just lovely with all these waterfalls. I really envy the person who owns this property um, that we're all staring at right now. <laughs> think about, this is White Island in New Zealand. And so think about off in the distance, there being a volcano erupting like that. And now we're transitioning from the Edinburgh into the lower Martinsburg. We're in the, what we call the basin, the deepest reach of, of that Epiric Sea. Again, we're not going into the Iapetus Ocean here. We're just in the Epiric Sea, but we're going into the deepest portion of it. And now we're starting to have an influx of this, of this terrestrial sediment that's washing down off of, uh, off of the um, uh, Taconian Mountains off in the distance. So if we move on there, I want you to think about the Shenandoah Valley at that time as something like this. This is from a marine sanctuary, and this is an image just of uh, the seafloor, a muddy seafloor. There's some crabs in this one. Um, there's a crab there. Uh, don't think of crabs. Think of um, this muddy, muddy seafloor. And that's kind of what the Martinsburg would have been like 450 million years ago. Under a significant amount of water, probably had to be illuminated if you were going to see anything down there because the sunlight was... Just, just deep enough for sunlight not to penetrate much. Um, and then, of course, this is what the Martinsburg looks like. Now, um, it's not nearly as blocky, and it's not nearly as limey here, of course. This still has some lime, some calcium in it, some calcium carbonate in it, in it and it's the lower Martinsburg uh, is, is kind of transitional from the Edinburgh to the, to the upper Martinsburg. Um, 
Martinsburg Formation, of course, named for Martinsburg, West Virginia. But we're down here in the, in the, in the deepest part of our empiric sea at that point. And uh, at this time, so the Taconian Island Arc is much closer to us than it, than it used to be. And we're down about right over here. This is an image courtesy of Callan Bentley's, one of his cartoons he likes to create from a map uh, made by Ron Blakey. He does uh, the paleogeographic maps here. But here is the paleo equator and there's the north, north arrow for north. And we're gonna talk about what turbidites are here in a moment. And that's, they're important because that's largely where the sediment's coming from. We still have some carbonate, but it's largely giving way to terrestrial sediments. You can see these are shales. And, and so while there's still some lime, limey stuff in there, it's largely terrestrial. To see that really well, we're gonna go on down to Milner Road, which is uh, not far away from where we were. Uh, and just remind ourselves um, what's going on here. So we've got a lot of stuff on this slide. I'm gonna back out a little bit. Uh, so we're gonna look, of course, we're at Massanutten Mount. We're down on this side of Massanutten Mount on the Shenandoah Valley side, again, another cartoon by Callan Bentley. And looking at the Massanutten and Synclinorium, you can imagine the Martinsburg formation being this orange formation that's plunging its way down beneath Massanutten Mountain, kind of cradling Fort Valley, if you will, kind of how I think about it. Um, here we are. The Martinsburg is almost vertical here. If you look at it closely, it's not quite vertical. And the 360 image here is a little bit misleading in that way. Um, but yeah, it's vertical and it's plunging down, dipping down like this, going under Mass Nutton Mountain. And that's exactly what this cartoon is depicting, practically vertical Martinsburg going, dipping down beneath there. And if we look um, nice and close up, this is what the Martinsburg looks like uh, at this location. We're moving into the middle Martinsburg and it's just, it's siltstones largely. And these, these are really cool images. You can zoom really, really far in here. What we call, these are alternating sequences though. If you look, if you look closely, you've got a, a, a nice thick, blocky, massive, uh, very resistant to weathering siltstone here. And then you got another one here. And then all this less resistant stuff in between. This is what we call differential weathering. And this is really important to our story. Up to this point, I've been giving you, um, you've been wondering where the seven bends are. I've been giving you this long history, right? Why, why have I been doing that? Well, because this is what's going to be all that played into the beginning to, to get where we are here and to talk about how these bends are formed. All right, so these are sequences, what we call Bauma sequences. And what's going on here are submarine landslides. And I'm just going to turn this off for the moment. This is looking at turbidity currents in the lab. And I'm just going to show you briefly what one of these looks like. Um, this is one being created down the marine slope. You can imagine these are Martinsburg sediments coming down off of that uh, Taconian mountain range. And the coarse stuff, sands and stuff, gets, uh, gets settles to the bottom. And then uh, it's the nature of more fine grain stuff to settle out later on. So we call it, or we call it a, a finding upward sequence where the coarse stuff gets deposited down here. And there's some other structures in here that are important as well as these things come down. We end up with a particular grading we call that um, Bauma back in 1962 published and called a Bauma sequence. And it's not important to get into all of this, but just note that the coarse grain stuff is down at the bottom and then it gets finer as you move up. And then you started the next Bauma sequence here. And here you've got um, one that's annotated where you can see the coarse grain materials down here on up to fine. And of course you're seeing also the, the layers as they're marked. So there's sequences of submarine landslides is what's, is what's going on over here. Here's, here's one in hand sample, coarse grain materials, going up to finer grain materials and so forth. There's another example. Uh, these are sideways though. Okay, so we've got sequences of landslides being deposited off of the Taconian Mountains. Volcanic eruptions, landslides and so forth. And so this is what's happening. We have these clastic sediments that are part of the, uh, so that's being brushed up from the subduction zone, uh, what we call a, uh, the accretionary wedge sediments that are being then eroded and eroded down into the, the basin here um, as in the form of turbidity currents. And uh, so that's what we're seeing deposited at, at the time here. Some of these sediments are coarse and very resistant to weathering and others are not. Okay. Then we get the, full, the, the formation of the, of the Appalachian Mountains themselves, which of course you're seeing the tilts, the tilting of the, of the, of the beds here, they're getting folded. And as eventually, um, you know, Africa and Europe are going to come and collide with North America and form the supercontinent Pangaea. 
and I'm going to skip a few things here eventually because I I know time is getting is going to be uh, my enemy here. Um, <laughs> as you fold rock like this, this is imagine this being the Martinsburg or any of these other beds. As you fold the rock, there's some interesting structural things that happen as a result of the stresses on this rock. The top of the fold is going to is going to stretch more than the bottom of the fold. That's actually going to experience some compression. So you're going to have tensional cracks begin to form up here and then compression down here, which is gonna create what's called, what's called rock cleavage, not mineral cleavage, rock cleavage that exists kind of almost perpendicular to the fold, to the, uh, to the bedding planes here. Also during this process and a result of other processes, you see these little gray lines that are forming over here. Those are called joints. And those are cracks in the rock that are, you can kind of think of them again as perpendicular again to the cleavage, but running along the bedding planes. Okay, and those are going to be important for us as we talk about um, these things here. And this one's not loading for some reason, so I'll just skip it. The Martinsburg, by the way, it also, also has fossils. And this is more graptolites. And I don't know why it's not loading. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to move on to our next, our next slide, which actually allows us to look at this cool 3D model here. Um, first, before we get to that, these are geologic maps. And I wanted to outline for you the Martinsburg formation extends up along this, this is Massanutten Mountain here in Fort Valley. The Massanutten, the Martinsburg Formation extends, this pink area, along the northeastern portion of Massanutten Mountain, around it essentially, and then down into Page County. You can see it doesn't, this is the area of Mount Jackson we looked at with the river sinuosity, and here it is in Woodstock. And you can see, um, we're gonna make a hypothesis here in a moment. And the, the river over here is flowing over the carbonates and over here it's flowing in the Martinsburg. If you look over here at Page County, you're also getting those bends over here while it flows to the Martinsburg. That's important to us. So the Martinsburg formation seems to have some kind of control on how the river behaves. We wanna talk about these, um, these uh, the bedding, cleavage and joints a little bit. This is a nice helpful 3D model that I um, created. Um, I could talk about how these are created um, if you'd like, but. This is uh, basically, this is a bedding plane over here. And see this flat top of the, of the rock is, is the actual bedding. You can see it's dipping, dipping down beneath Mass and Mountain and so forth. Because of the stresses on it during the deformation that occurred when Africa and Europe slammed into North America to create Pangaea, you get, if you look at the side here, you can see these vertical cracks that are perpendicular to the bedding. Those are the cleavage traces, all right? And then over here, this is a great outcrop for this. You can see this nice vertical crack here that's perpendicular to the cleavage traces, and those are what we call joints. Now, um, this is important because what we're going to talk about is the fact that the meander bends, our hypothesis is this, that the high degree of regularity of the features along the seven bends reach of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River is controlled primarily by the structure and geology of the Martinsburg Formation, primarily. There's other controls going on, but we're going to talk focus on that primary one. Specifically that the meander bends are controlled by the direction of the formation bedding and the meander straightaways are controlled by the direction of the joints. And so the bedding is going to be important here because that's going to be largely controlling the, 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 straight, the, the bends of the river and the joints here provides areas of weakness that the water is able to um, take advantage of to form the straightaways in the, in the, uh, along the river here. And so some profound, deep and philosophical consideration. I always like to throw a little bit of this in there. If this hypothesis is true, then all the geological events leading up to this moment, up to this moment led to the formation of these iconic seven bends of the Shenandoah River. And that's why I've gone through all of this up to this point. Okay, let's keep on going here. We're gonna go back up to um, Mass Nutton, the Mass Nutton sandstones. So about 430 million years ago, you can imagine uh, this, is, this, this is now terrestrial sands what the Shenandoah Valley looked like at that time. Uh, and of course, we can look at that in more detail here. Here's, this is up in the, the little hike to the tower. You get cross bedding in the mass of Nutton. Uh, this is uh, what we call cross bedding where you get these layers in the sandstone. And then you have, you have diagonal layers and then you have a flat layer that cuts it off. The four set beds and the top set beds, typical of, uh, of, of areas that have moving water. Uh, so we know we're definitely within wave base. And the mass of also has a lot of pebbles in it. And you can see here, there's a lot of larger sand grains and pebbles and cobbles, which suggests that you have terrestrial influx of streams and such um, contributing to that. Now, if we move on to the next spot here, it's one of my favorite spots. I also want you to think about there being 
little organisms making their making traces as they scurry along in the in the sands here. And indeed, uh, by the way, we're up here now in the Massanutten Formation up here. Indeed, if we look at this particular outcrop, you can see along all what looks like, and you may have seen this yourself when you've been up there and been curious when you take it, if you can get through the poison ivy vines, um, why, why this looks the way that it does. These are arthrophycus traces. This is these are trace fossils of um, little, some organism, we're not entirely sure which one, of course, I showed you this other organism over here, that's a modern one um, that created these traces. But that's, that's what we call trace fossils. See, trace fossils are, or ichno fossils are evidence of behavior. And those are really important to us, in the fossil record. So again, we're, uh, we're now in a, in a sort of shallower setting here in the mass nut. All right, so um, we know that we have uh, these Appalachian mountains here though, of course, by, by the Cretaceous period, these had all weathered and eroded away. They were completely gone. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, well, how would the river form the way that it is uh, if these mountains weren't here? And of course, the mountains have to be here for the mount for this valley to exist. So what, where did the mountains come from? You may not realize this, but the mountains, again, were um, all gone at one point. I'm not going to go through this. There was, there was another mountain building event called the Acadian, which led to, of course, the Allegheny and Orogeny, another third mountain building event that eventually formed Pangaea. And at this time, Virginia is here, which we're further north, closer to the equator. But imagine this mountain range at the time being similar to the Himalayas today. Very tall mountains, perhaps as, as high as 30,000 feet. Okay, and of course, um, the folds that we've talked about up to this point, these are, these are folds uh, along corridor H and uh, uh, limestone's very similar, a little bit further up section from ours. Um, but you can see a nice anticline and a nice syncline. Um, but these rocks didn't start out this way. They were made this way by the collision that created Pangaea. Pangaea eventually rifted apart though. And uh, at the end of the Triassic period, just before the dinosaurs began to roam around and uh, created rift zones that, um, you know, like Culpeper, Virginia is in the middle of a rift, of what was a rift zone. But by the time the Cretaceous rolled around, there was nothing left of these mountains. They were gone. But during the Cenozoic, something happens. They get uplifted, they're up warped or rejuvenated. And then they get weathered to weathered and eroded to what we see today. And this is all along the Mid-Atlantic, of course, and the Appalachians that we see today are a result of all of this. And um, the formation of today's Appalachians, we think actually the most recent hypotheses are developed, are actually being worked on by uh, none other than one of our local geologists, Elizabeth Johnson, and her colleague, John Haynes, and some others who are working on um, this process, looking at places like Mole Hill and some of the other volcanics in the area uh, where they've been able to show um, that there's there's the mafic rock being brought up from the met from the mantle that brings with it uh, rock that's specifically mantle rock and also sandstones brought, brings to the surface and deposits them on limestones which is what mole hill essentially is a volcano down east of harrison west of harrisonburg um, and there's a lot of other volcanics around the valley there was no this is a passive margin again at that time and there were no essentially the mountains were, weren't here anymore so why are we getting volcanism at the time the thought is that there's up warping of the mantle the cause for that is still um, much debated. Um, it has something to do with subduction into the west on the western part of North America, but it is probably still the result of some of the earthquakes we have today, among other things. So the Shenandoah, the, the the Appalachian Mountains that you see here, this little this little topographic blurb on top here, is a result of rejuvenation that occurred around 50 million years ago, and subsequently has been eroding ever since. So we go back to um, Milliner Road here. And instead of, this is back at our, our little hypothesis area again. And as we wrap things, can we move along here, we're gonna go down here. This is uh, along um, uh, Bethel Road. And of course, this is a typical portion of the Shenandoah River, the North Fork here, a uh, nice quiescent stream. I'm not seeing a lot of bedrock along here, uh, but you can see the mountain, Massanut Mountain off in the distance. I'm around the bend of a meander actually. and uh, you know, what, what would I look for to, to, to know what's controlling this? Well, here at this location, it's tough to, it's tough to know what to look for. Um, but I know that back behind me, there is some Martinsburg. It's pretty weathered and hard to tell. But let's go see if we can find another location that might be a little bit better. Ah, here we are, Deer Run Rapids Road. If we down, look down over here, we see these interesting linear rapids. If you've ever done, done canoeing on the South Fork, you see these same things. These are the resistant 
sandstone beds, the base of those turbidites we talked about a little bit before. Um, the beds here are dipping actually toward Massanutten Mountain. They're diving down beneath Massanutten Mountain, cradle, getting ready to cradle it, right? And uh, that's why you get these linear rapids. Of course, there's boulders and other things that get caught up between, got caught up on the other side of them um, on, the, on the upstream side, but you can see another linear rapid up there and so forth. This is pretty typical of the area. And so this is a great location to see this. And of course, when the water is a little bit lower, it's also a great place to get in the water. Um, but again, more linear rapids here. This is that those thick sandstones of the Martinsburg that we saw before uh, that don't weather really well. Um, unlike this, the finer stuff in between the thick sandstones, it does. And so that helps define some of the bedding. Uh, but you can see the bed, it doesn't go away, right? The, the, the straightaways of the meander, this is a straightaway, are able to make their way right over that bedding. Um, along the joint fractures and uh, parallel to those. So let's move along and, and, and check out some more, some more locations. There's another story here, by the way, there's these alluvial fan deposits. This is Journey Up Stables. I don't know if we have anybody here who's um, affiliated with them or not, but um, thank you for uh, um, letting me take a picture from a distance, even though you didn't know I was doing it. This is where I took the picture uh, along the road there. Uh, you can't really see the stables, but these are this is Massanut Mountain, and in the LiDAR imagery, you can see this, these nice alluvial deposits. Alluvial deposits are basically um, chunks of sediment that wash off of the mountains uh, and onto land, and as opposed to a delta, which is a similar thing that goes into a body of water. And um, forms, you see that kind of forms part of, the, part of the meander lobe here, but it's a little bit of a secondary control on the meanders to some extent. Um, but these are later. These came, probably were deposited during the Pliocene and Pleistocene in the last five million years, and so those are those are kind of cool features to keep in mind here as we as we move along here, and of course little drainage basins. I'm gonna skip that one for the moment. Um, this is really cool. There's a longer history of the river here. Uh, this is along um, this the same road. You can see um, I'm I'm taking the picture from this location right over here. There's that pond that was in the foreground of the picture. Do you see this big U-shaped trace? That's an ancient meander channel. That used to be the river's, the, the river's course. And uh, this is where the river is now. That meander was cut off, which is typical of meandering streams. But you'll note that the stream now is much, is much deeper and much lower in elevation than it, than it was during this time. So this is a, a terrace deposit going back thousands of years, maybe even a couple of million years. Um, it's hard to say without doing some sort of surface exposure dating of that, which would be really interesting. But I find that to be a really cool reason. It's a reason why this part of the road is so flat. If you're wondering where we are, we can look. We're still around Tom's Brook over here. All right, moving along here. Um, we see there's that's not the only one. There's another abandoned meander channel down here that will that will kind of drive by. So those are kind of cool things that you don't see unless you're actually looking at the LIDAR imagery. So how old are these are, are these deposits? Keep in mind what's going on in Ohio and Pennsylvania. There's a wall of ice to our north, a couple hundred miles to our north, um, that's creating a really cold polar-like environment. And uh, to our south, we have the Gulf and the, and the uh, Atlantic coast. And this is only a few million years ago at this point with warmer, moist air. And so we got a lot of interesting weather occurring, right? Here's the glacial margin. So we've got the, the confluence of dry, dry cold air masses with warm wet air masses. And that is gonna be right over our area is gonna be a really moist place uh, to hang out. And here's that uh, alluvial fan. There's not much left of this one. It's been largely weathered or eroded away, but that's the, where I'm taking the picture from. So how, do we, how old are they? That's a great, it's, it's a great question to ask. And down over here, there's been some dating by a few people, Odom 2020 as a, as a doctoral thesis, but, um, and some others that have dated them between these, these alluvial deposits, boulder fields and so forth, between 800,000 and, and one and a half million years old. So when you look at these alluvial deposits, you think of them as being pretty young. And that's right during the height of the Pleistocene, during the ice ages. And so that makes sense. It all kind of adds up at that point. The river was here. I, I don't have any reason to believe the river wasn't there at the time. And it probably was a much bigger river, river at the time than it is today with all that extra moisture. All right, so here we are. I'm going to go through some of these a little bit faster just because um, they show a lot of the same stuff. Um, this is another, now we're in that, actually in that abandoned meander channel. 
what I've done here is I've shown you, this is the bedding trace of the Martinsburg right along this meander bend, just to show you that. And then this is the dipping, dip angle towards Mass Nutton. Um, but they, again, the joint traces are running across, across along dip. And um, if we look here, there's a nice, another nice linear rapid, though because we're around the bend of a meander, uh, it's, it's oriented differently than it was before. The, the, the rock hasn't moved, but the river is bending around it right now. And as we move along over to this side, uh, the river is continuing its meander bend over there. All right, so we'll move on over here. Got some Martinsburg behind us, kind of hard to see much in the way of its orientation. Another alluvial fan hill, <clears throat> okay, as we drive along this, this is the river over here. We're driving along a straightaway. And this, this road happens to be right along a straightaway. And again, same straightaway. And uh, we're seeing a lot of the same same stuff, the Martinsburg on the right, dipping down towards Mass Nut Mountain, which is off in the distance over here. This is Shenandoah River Lodge. Maybe you're probably familiar with that. So what part of a meander are we standing by? It? How can you tell? Um, it's more of a rhetorical question. We've got the, the Martinsburg here dipping uh, below Mass Nut Mountain again, but you can see uh, we're right around the bend of a meander at this location. And if I show you where we are, uh, I can zoom right in. We're right here at this location. There's the lodge over here, and there's the bridge, and the rock is is right over here. The bedding is right along the uh, the bend of the meander. And so, uh, there's some funky images here in my receding hairline. Um, but <clears throat> if you look here, there's I've tried to draw a little line where the Martinsburg was heading. You can see it's dipping down to the right, uh, and as we move along here, so I'm going to really mess with your mess with your your, your vision here a little bit. Um, and the purpose of this image was actually to look at this, this side again a little more closely. So, all right, you can tell I like this location a lot. Uh, I had fun here, but we're gonna move on. Um, this, again, supporting our hypothesis that the bends are controlled by the bedding of the, of, the, of the Martinsburg. Here we are in Arts Road, the Arts Road Bridge, and there's the Stonewall Mill over here. We can look at the other side. I don't have anything to work on in terms of actual um, convincing evidence here to show you in terms of the of our hypothesis, but I show this to you mostly for historical significance. You can see the old mill race here, uh, and then uh, what's left of the Stonewall Mill, which uh, <clears throat> at least this is a picture I found of what it, what it uh, seems to look like uh, years ago. Um, but of course, this part of the human story here, or, you know, the importance of the river, of course, is the human story. And so the use of the, of the river for milling and other things, um, among other things, of course, hydroelectric, um, the generation of hydroelectric power. This is the Birdshire Dam. Um, and I'm kind of curious, actually, because this, the dam is built right across the straightaway of the river. And I have to wonder if it was easier to build the dam here because of the fact that the bedding is running across the river. And my guess is that it was probably easier to pour the concrete for that um, because of that reason. Uh, so I, you know, have to wonder. And again, here we have another um, alluvial area inside a meander bend. And if we keep on going, this is River Road, by the way. <clears throat> I wanted to end our, our well, sort of um, getting towards the end here. I uh, wanted to look at this area. This is Lupton Road. As you drive down off of um, off of River, is it River Road? Um, anyway, so you're moving down Lupton Road towards Seven Bend State Park, right over here. Um, that's where we are. And you can see we're right around a meander bend as well, again, and you can see the beds are dipping in the way that you, they should be dipping. So Mass Nut Mountain is um, over here, and the beds are dipping just the way we would expect them to dip, helping to form uh, the meander bend down here. And of course, here the water level is a little higher, and I'm not able to see any linear rapids. Um, there's, a, of course, the boat launch. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, that's, um, that's how this is being formed. So of course, Seven Bend State Park is right in this area. This is a nice, a nice LIDAR imagery of the park. Uh, for, you, for the Friends of the North Fork folks, I like to throw this in there because uh, I know how, how, how much you all love Seven Bend State Park, right? Uh, and so um, the Friends of the North Fork has done a lot of work with Seven Bend State Park. And here's again, this is a Hollingsworth Road entrance area. And again, the beds are dipping um, again towards Massanutten Mountain, which is exactly what you would expect. And uh, this is nice uh, bridge over here. And as you walk out on it, again, there's some um, used vineyards over here, but again, the, uh, the straightaway of the river and uh, 
just another view of it essentially. All right, now let's move over into the carbonate area. I'm gonna go back up here and we're gonna go towards, uh, this is Chapman's Landing. Now we're south of Woodstock uh, and we're back into the carbonates. It's hard to see because of the lighting here, but these are all carbonate rocks. And uh, this part of the river is not, uh, we're no longer in the Seven Bends area. Uh, and I wanted to show you uh, mainly, um, you know, this is down by a bridge, of course. So some of this accumulation is because of the bridge, but we got a, a lot of smaller cobbles and pebbles and stuff. The bedrock's not as obvious here uh, in the carbonate area. The carbonate rocks uh, dissolve much more easily than the, uh, than the Martinsburg formation does. And so that's a lot of the contributor, uh, a lot of the contributing, contributing factors as to why the bends don't exist here like they do other places. All right, this is our second to last slide. This is at Red Banks. Here's the river over here. This is just north of Mount Jackson. Again, we're back in the carbonates. I put this slide in here mainly to show you this. This is when I say river terrace, I mean the ancient floodplain. So we're down here in the modern floodplain. You know, when it floods really badly, you can get up this high. But I'm thinking about this area over here, the little higher area that you can see. You used, you know, if you drive by here, you've probably all driven by here, and you wondered why that hill exists. Well, that's the ancient Shenandoah River floodplain. I'm going to show, take you to a location across the road from uh, where I work at Massanutten Regional Governor's School and show you another portion of the same terrace. And this is the farm across from the school triple tech, which is over here. And if we zoom in here, this was, this was created using drone imagery. Um, and uh, this is the current floodplain. And then this is the ancient floodplain. And I was, you know, I, I was able to map this or match this to the geologic maps of the area. And in fact, that's exactly how it's mapped. So the river doesn't flood up, flood this high anymore at this elevation. Um, it does flood over up to this, these elevations, but the river's been down cutting since then, um, since this time. And so these ancient floodplains go back to the Pleistocene era, or epic rather. And say, so, yes, the era is a very, very important, use the right term here geologically. These ancient floodplains, these terraces go to the Pleistocene epic and so forth, back to that glacial or that, those ice age time periods. And that's, that's important. So the, uh, the river was flowing still back then and uh, that history is all here. So again, here we are in the lovely Shenandoah Valley, not outside the, the down here at Mims Bottom, the current floodplain uh, and the covered bridge over to my side here. Um, anyway, that's the end of this geological field trip. This is the Odyssey. Uh, I wanna thank my family, um, Sarah, Joey, Ezra and Gratian for all of their support. I want to thank the Friends of the North Fork for giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you, my, uh, my school and colleagues, and the more charitable trust, uh, and, the, and the county school system for making it possible to create this, uh, and then Callan Bentley and Dr. Daniel Doctor for some of the imagery that I've used here um, to go through this. So again, I hope you've enjoyed the talk, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have at this point. Great, thank you so much, Russ. That was amazing. So great to get a geological context on the, the valley history. Um, okay, so just as a note, if you have any questions, it would be great if you could directly message them to Friends of the North Fork uh, in the Zoom chat box. We have a plethora of questions already. Um, so just for the sake of ease, we're gonna try to continue to keep ourselves muted so that Russ can um, answer the questions I direct his way. So again, please direct message them to Friends of the North Fork, um, which is the Zoom I'm operating off of. So to get started, we have um, a question. How are these ancient geologic features and locations named? So the example given is Beekman Town, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and they're wondering when a Coors Town might appear in the literature. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, we named the, it's a good question. We name rock formations for locations. We don't name them after people. You know, when you discover a new organism. There is, there's naming conventions for that that are agreed upon within the scientific community. It's the same, and you, of course, then you might get you might get it named after you if you discover something like that. But with rock formations, we always name them after a location, and that's part of the naming conventions that we use in the geosciences, and uh, or generally name them after a location. And we don't ever name them after people because people kind of move around, right? And so if we say the Edinburgh Formation, uh, we're going to locate that uh, what we call a type locality. 
So there's a particular outcrop that defines the Edinburgh Formation and what we mean by the Edinburgh Formation. Uh, it's the same with the Newmarket, same with the Beekman Town. I have to go look look back at the, US, the USGS literature to see where Beekman Town comes from. Beekman Town is actually a group of formations, uh, including the Pinesburg Station, Dolomite, and a bunch of other names like that. Um, but yeah, they, they're all based on locations. Uh, very good question. Fabulous. So next question is, would the graptolite zooid have been similar to a coral polyp? And would it have produced a similar structure to a coral, which enabled habitat for other things? You no, know, that's, that's an interesting question. And I, the, the easiest question, the easiest answer to that is to say, I don't know. Um, we know that um, they were colonial. Uh, that's, our, that's our hypothesis. And I should say, we, that's our hypothesis is that they're a colonial organism. Everything seems to point to that because you can look at the uh, as, you know, SEM images or scanning electron micros, microscope images of the Thiki and and you know they're definitely uh, there's definitely a place for a zoid of some sort to live in it. What they look like, the organism itself, the little polyps or zoids, we don't know. And so um, it's I don't doubt that my, some sort of microbial life might have lived on these on, on the uh, the larger organism, the larger larger colony. Uh, but it was a planktonic, so it was floating around. And so unlike coral, which of course is situated on the seafloor, and uh, doesn't, and of course the coral reefs are so productive, uh, the, the waters themselves are really nutrient poor, but the, the reefs are so productive because of the waste products being produced by the, all the organisms that are there and the, and the ability of the coral polyps to, to process the photosynthesis and the, and the, the nice symbiotic relationship with the zentelli algae and so on. <clears throat> we know a lot about all of that because of, because of the fact we still have them around today. Both the graptolites as we don't. And so the fossil record uh, preserves them poorly to begin with. Uh, and then we have no modern examples to look to. So it's a great question. Um, easiest answer is I don't know. Awesome. Uh, question I had was, could you put the term colonial into context in terms of time? What do you mean? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> that's a good, that's a good, because uh, colonial has a, has a lot of uh, context, doesn't it? Yeah. When, when I when I say colonial um, in the in the paleontological uh, usage of it, we're just saying a group of organisms that live together and that that are in a sort of um, a community, and they rely on each other. And typically, when we say colonial, like a graptolite, they're all the same organisms, and they uh, they have a sort of um, communal living, if you will. And uh, typically, when that happens, like say with coral. Uh, those types of organisms, uh, again, you have a, a situation where you have thousands of polyps living in a, in a reef, in a small portion of a reef, and they're all doing the same things, but they all rely on each other uh, and, and in order to survive. And that's the kind of context we're looking at, not like a colonialism uh, sort of thing in a human in, from a human perspective. So very kind of very different. You might think of it as um, there were a human perspective, I don't, I, I'm going to hesitate. I'm, I'm not going to use an anthrop, I'm not going to anthropo, anthropomorphize the, the paleontological colony or the, the colonial organisms here. That's, that would be a dangerous thing to do, I think. Um, right. But that, I hope that helps. Yeah, totally. Um, oh, so many questions. Okay, one common question is if you could send out the, ro the route you drove for the presentation so that people can follow your steps and see things um, in person for themselves. And I, yeah, you can speak to that, but also I should say that the presentation and the link to uh, the virtual field trip will be available after the fact for people to go through. Yeah, so um, good question. So what, what we would um, want to do here is when you get the link to this, and I'm going to be adding audio to each of these slides, um, each of these images uh, after the fact. I didn't do that now because I'm, I was presenting it live. But that's the next task is to add audio, and that'll take a little bit, um, take me a couple of weeks probably to get that done. Uh, but when you do get a hold of this, and even before the audio is added, and of course it's all the same link. So even after the audio is added, it'll still be this link. Uh, this is all available to you, and uh, these all this all this, the sites are here. Um, in terms of how to translate this map into um, a map that you could use for directions, I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look into that. I haven't tried to do that from Kula yet, but I'm sure there's a way. If nothing else, you can zoom in on here and see where we are. Of course, like the beginning sites here, we're all along Battlefield Road, which uh, comes off of that location south of Strasbourg where, where the Route 11 splits. Um, but 
yeah, it's all located. If you go, when you get into this and, and click on the little map icon down here at the bottom, you can see where all the sites are. Fantastic. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. How many millions of years until the, well, how many in parentheses, millions question mark, of years until the most likely mountain forming event in our region? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, a long, long, long time from now, uh, none of none of your, none of our descendants uh, will even remember who we are by the time that ever that happens. And in fact, um, we're we're looking at a situation that where the most likely scenario, because you know, this, the formation of supercontinents happens cyclically. So for, before Pangaea, there was Rodinia about a billion years ago, uh, and then the continents separated and they came back together in a different configuration to form Pangaea, and they're separating now. They're still separating. The Atlantic Ocean is still getting bigger. At some point that will, that will um, stop and the Atlantic Ocean will begin to get smaller. And it's been hypothesized the most likely margin for the volcano, for subduction to begin isn't the Eastern Atlantic, but the Western Atlantic here under North America and so forth. And so, but you're probably looking at, um, you're probably looking at uh, well over a hundred million years down the road before uh, another supercontinent or before the Atlantic would be anywhere near um, closing and um, it, it probably longer than that, honestly. Uh, but at that point, there'll be volcanoes where we live now, which is kind of a cool thing. And these mountains that we see here will have been gone long before that. Well, cool. sadly. Just a note for those who are attending, I'm going to ask some of these follow up questions. Feel free to leave whenever you need to. But there are some really good questions that I think would be useful useful for people to know if they're interested and good to have recorded anyway. Um, so two questions sent at once. How high were the mountains after the quote unquote rejuvenation Russell referred to and mm -hmm. when did the Shenandoah River start flowing? Um, I don't have answers to either of those questions. So uh, those are those are good ones. The uh, the rejuvenated mountains were certainly no tall, no nowhere near as high as the, uh, as, as the um, ancient Alleghenies were um, at the formation of Pangaea. They probably weren't that much taller than they are today, to be quite honest. But I would have to do a little research on that to, be, to give you an, uh, an answer. And I'm not sure there, that an answer really exists on that. That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, as far as the other one, when did the Shadow River start flowing? Um, all I can say about that is it's flowing today. And I can say that it was it seems to have been flowing certainly within the last couple of million years. Going much beyond that, uh, what we see is the, Sh the Shenandoah today, uh, you know, was a different river back then, probably uh, from, what, from what evidence we have, probably a bigger river. And uh, it was probably still flowing toward the north, but at some point going far enough back, the rivers in our area were likely flowing to the south towards the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that's that's one model that's put out there. I couldn't tell you when it started flowing. That would be another thing that uh, another a good area of research. Certainly, and something I think both of those things are things that would have to be determined by modeling in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is this river formation unique, or is there anywhere else in the country or world where this combination of geologic factors exists, to the best of your knowledge? That's a great question, and I really should have anticipated that one, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I, I would actually, I might have to look into that and, uh, and get back to you. I know, I know there are plenty of rivers that are, that are controlled by a geologic, by the geology beneath them. I mean, I think of, for instance, the up in Canada in the Laurentide areas um, where uh, the bedrock, you have the original craton, that, the original multi-billion year old rock that forms the, the core of our continent. And when the water flows over that, it flows along the cracks in that rock. And so you get really strange irregular river patterns. And it's not exactly like the Seven Bends, but there are plenty of places like that where the bedrock geology controls how the river flows, more so than say uh, the gradient of the, of the land or other things that we tend to think about in terms of modern geomorphological characteristics. So there are the geology ultimately controls river flow, but it's it's more it's greater in some places than it is in others. So even like here in the valley around the Mount Jackson area, 
it's not nearly as um, significant a control as it is along the Woodstock area. So even along individual rivers, it can vary fairly significantly. Fantastic. Uh, just as a note, for the sake of time, I'm just going to ask the rest of the questions I already have. So if you have any more questions, you can uh, email them to me at mariamma.dryak at fnfsr.org. And I'll put that in the chat box right now. Um, but I'm going to ask a question already asked, um, which is, is the source of the Catoctin formation on the Blue Ridge part of the island arc system? Um, and was that originally a part of the ancient continent, Rodin? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> the uh, Catoctin greenstones, uh, that's what you're referring to. And those are the ancient lava flow deposits that exist along the, the ridge of Shenandoah National Park and the Blue Ridge, the Blue, Blue Ridge Mountains uh, generally. Those are, uh, those are generally uh, interpreted as, especially based on uh, age dating and so forth there, uh, they're interpreted as uh, some of the rocks that existed or that were produced during the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia um, about about seven to eight hundred to a billion years ago. And so they're pretty old. Um, they're essentially unrelated to, uh, gen at least genetically, to the rocks that are in our area. Uh, they would be more of a bedrock. And at some point down beneath the rocks in our area, you would likely encounter them. And an example of that would be, if I go back to the uh, the beginning of the of the presentation, I had that strat column here, and here's an example of that. So, <clears throat> down beneath the Elbrook and the Waynesboro and the Tomstown formation, um, down below that, you would be get you would get to the Catoctin greenstones, and so those rocks would be uh, in the in the whole strat column we talked about here, way down over here, down where the legend is, and then eventually you'd get to the granites below that. Um, that actually formed the would have been the core of that whatever the continent, you know, the sort of chunk of continent that existed at the time was. Uh, so they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're a different genesis, but they're still very interesting. Uh, I love the Catoctin greenstones, a lot of interesting little, little bits of stuff in there that um, tell important stories, for maybe for another time though. Good question though. Yeah, um, this is an interesting one. What created the gaps in the Massanutten Mountains, i.e. Edinburgh, New market, et cetera. And did it have anything to do with the North and South Forks possibly connecting at some time? Yeah, I can't speak to the North and South Fork connecting, other than, of course, what we, the confluence we are all aware of if it's uh, up at Front Royal. Um, but, you know, I've heard those, I've heard those gaps as described primarily as water gaps, uh, but which is basically where they, uh, they're formed by, um, or whereas water gaps and wind gaps, and of course one is one one is formed primarily by wind, and one's formed by primarily by water. And I think that's still an open question for the most part. But I think if you think about those gaps, those are formed um, most likely. If, if I were to make a hypothesis, my hypothesis would be that they were formed during all of this Pleistocene aged um, uh, weathering and erosion that's forming all the alluvial deposits that we see in our area, and so. I don't have a, a, a solid answer for you on that. I'd have to look into it some more and, um, and get back to you. But basically that is, that's how I would interpret those. I was actually gonna try to pull um, one of these alluvial things and that wasn't one of them. Uh, and that certainly wasn't one of them. But over here, you know, these alluvial deposits are probably uh, cogenetic in the sense that they, they existed or were formed at the same time as those, as those gaps. And those gaps were prob probably just primary places for water to move down through them. So, you know, they were probably formed by, by mountain streams that just that they, they just uh, eroded their, their channels down to the point where you had, um, where they made a break in the mountain that today we refer to as an easy place to travel over, right? But clearly there's no river flowing through the mountain there. Uh, not Certainly not today. And there certainly, certainly wasn't before um, the mountains were rejuvenated or until sometime perhaps before the mountains were rejuvenated. So it's, I'd have to get back to you on, on any more details than that. But that would be my, my hypothesis would be they'd be, be, they'd be Pleistocene in age and uh, result of erosion from during that time period. Okay, two more questions. Sure. And we'll call it a day. So is the way that the geology informs the shape of the river predictive so does the shape of other rivers give you insight into the underlying formations? And if so, where else might we see these effects? Yeah, so that's kind of similar to that question we had a little while ago. Um, 
and it's 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 tough. I can't really make a, a determination. I can't really say that this is always the case where you can definitely determine exactly what the geology is doing. It's even hard here. I mean, we happen to have a lot of outcrops where we can see what the geology is doing. But I'll be honest with you, I say a lot and I, uh, very carefully, because if you go out, out west where there's much less vegetation, uh, you can see a lot more rock and it's much more obvious what the rock is doing. Now, some places, especially out here in the east, it's very difficult to tell what the geology is doing and, and how it's how or how much it's controlling uh, the flow of a river, especially in places. Um, well, I guess one could say it's always controlling it on one hand, but the bedrock geology of like it's, like it's hard bedrock versus, say, glacial deposits, right? There's places in the northeast or up north of what the glacial margin was where you have sand and gravel deposits and streams flowing over those flow you know, pretty much wherever, however they want to based on the gradient. And so sometimes it's more of a, sometimes they're controlled more by gradient, but it's not always easy to figure that out without having um, a significant amount of information about the bedrock. But I can say I'm from Northern Ohio and the rock up that way is pretty horizontal. It's not, it's not tilting, right? It's not dipping like it is here. And so the glacial deposits sitting on top of that uh, are, are, are largely what the streams are flowing through. And so the bedrock itself, the solid bedrock, isn't doing much in terms of controlling stream flow. It's mostly, mostly the shape of the landscape in terms of what, what the glaciers left behind, moraine deposits, things like that, and the, uh, and the gradient of the land. And so I'm kind of making a distinction between the solid bedrock controlling streams versus the, um, the surficial alluvial or colluvial deposit of uh, loose sediment controlling it or versus the gradient of, of the, the, the great, as I should say, the gradient controlling it um, entirely. I don't know if that helps or not, but I, I don't really have, I can't really make a determination or say that there's, it, you can always see that. I think you can hypothesize that it is. And then you look for further evidence like you would in any other situation. Right. Maybe not a very satisfying answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Last question for today. Again, you can email me more questions and I can connect you with Russ. Um, can you speak to the block field seen on the Massanutten that suggests a time frame of the last ice age in our area? The boulder fields? Block fields. Yeah, block fields, boulder fields. Yeah. So that was, um, gosh, what slide was that? That was back here. Uh, we talked about that briefly. It was, it was that one or it was, no, it wasn't that one. It was back here a bit. Yeah. So I, I talked about um, that a little bit. And I'm just not, I don't know where I left that, that particular slide. But there was, yeah, one of these slides, I talked about that a little bit. Um, so surface exposure dating is about the only thing that people have tried, been successful at trying to use for that. What that basically is, you have, um, you have isotopes that react, uh, or that um, are, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I'll, I'll preface this by saying that. But there are certain radiogenic isotopes that are, uh, that are either produced or that are affected by uh, cosmic rays. So we call them cosmogenic isotopes, and they're uh, they're when you have a surface that's exposed uh, a certain a certain amount, a certain amount of time ago, uh, it'll have a certain amount of those radiogenic isotopes, and they of course they they dissipate over time. And so, um, as you bury it, uh, the the ratio or the the amount of that isotope changes. And I'm just going to try to keep it as simple as I can there. But basically, we can date the exposure, when the last exposure of that material was. And so if we look at the boulder fields, that's how we're able to say or hypothesize that they, uh, in some cases, are 800,000 years in age versus a million and a half years in age. Um, but whatever the dates are, the minimum, and we say the minimum date in that case, uh, we can't say the maximum date of exposure is, we can just speak to the minimum. And so it at least tells us that they've been exposed at least that long ago. And so um, some of the boulder fields you see on top of these alluvial deposits um, have been there at least 800,000 to a million and a half years um, uh, from, you know, before today. And um, that tells us that they may have been, right? We can hypothesize that they were produced as a result of uh, the, uh, the meteorological or climatic conditions that existed here during the time of the ice ages. And you know, it was probably a lot wetter. It certainly seems to have probably been a lot wetter if we think about what the, um, the confluence of air masses was like at the time. And so um, you know, this, this is an area of active research. I'll say all that also. The only, um, Odom was one uh, 
uh, reference that I found on that, that, that doctoral thesis. There's a couple of students at, uh, from William and Mary who've done a little work on that on the eastern side of Massanutt Mountain in Page County. And uh, the dates all seem to be pretty similar. Uh, then doctor at the USGS was kind of just verbally telling me about another study uh, that I haven't seen the result of yet that argues um, for a similar similar situation. And so they all seem to be kind of coming to that those conclusions using the, the surface exposure dating as a, as a way of doing that. It's not super precise dating. It's not like, a, not even as precise to say a past potassium argon date of a zircon crystal in some three billion year old rock. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room in those dates, but that's generally how we're able to sort of constrain those alluvial deposits, those boulder fields to about that age, at least that age. Nice. Um, that, those are, that's the end of the questions I'm going to ask for today. Do you have anything else you want to share, Russ? Oh, well, um, I don't have anything else specifically to share, but I do need to get back to these last couple slides for you, don't oh, I? Yes, please press um, last slide specifically. I think the one before the second to last. Yes, right. That was supposed to be on that one for the questions. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So thanks all for attending the lecture and for sending in questions. Um, the recorded version of the virtual field trip and this talk, along with the link to the field trip as it's presented, as Russ has been interacting with it in Kula, will be available on our website at fnfsr.org. If you aren't a member of Friends of the North Fork, we encourage you to see what we're all about and to join friends by visiting our website, again, fnfsr.org. Um, and don't forget to attend our upcoming lectures within the Seven Bends Lecture Series, as you can see on this slide here. We have two more talks for this spring. And again, if you have any additional questions, please get in touch. Thank you so much, Russ, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, it clearly was a hit given how many questions I've been bombarded with. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cool to learn more about the Valley. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for everybody for being here. Thanks, Russ. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a lovely Sunday. <laughs>